usually we hold these talks at Sea Life Mooloolaba, but for obvious reasons that can't be done. So here we are virtually meeting. Um, firstly, Firstly, I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands we're meeting on tonight and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and respect the continued connection to land and sea country. Um, this beautiful photo was taken at Majimba Island or Old Woman Island, which is um, has a very nice um, Aboriginal story about its creation. Um, if you don't know about it, you should look it up because it's a really nice story which involves Mount Cool and Mount Nindiri uh, and the Maricha River as well. What do I keep doing that? Okay. Um, so, Reef Check, if, you, if there's many new people to um, us and what we do, uh, Reef Check is a not for profit organization whose mission is to promote healthy local coral reefs, uh, ecosystems through scientific research, community education and marine conservation. Um, I am a volunteer with Reef Check Australia. I um, volunteer as a reef ambassador um, where we organize events. We try to bring um, science to the public and we try to educate people on what little changes they could make in their life to have a positive impact on uh, the environment in general, especially coral reefs. Um, most of us, well, I think most of us are based on the Sunshine Coast. Actually, there's going to be a question about that on the next poll, on the next slide. Um, so we all have a deep connection with the ocean. So we all have a role to play in protecting them. Um, so we're going to launch a couple of polling questions on this slide while I run through some housekeeping. Um, they'll only be open for maybe 10, 15 seconds. So if you could answer them for us that would be a great help and we appreciate that. Um, so most of you will be muted that's just because otherwise there's just a lot of noise if someone's washing up in the kitchen behind you we hear that if someone's watching tv we hear that so um, we've got you muted but it doesn't mean we don't want to listen to you so if you have any questions we would love for you to put them into uh, a chat the chat box which is should be on your screen somewhere. If you can't see it, just wiggle your mouse and a little uh, window should pop up and you should be able to answer, sorry, enter some questions in there. Uh, we will be having those questions at the end. So uh, a couple of us will be moderating the chat box. Um, we won't forget about the questions. We'll get to them at the end. Um, just the way it works with Ken's talk tonight. Uh, and if you wanted to jump on our email list, you can send your contact details to seqevents at reefcheckaustralia.org. That way you'll be notified of any upcoming events, including these talks, which are held every month on the second Tuesday of the month. A few things that have happened in the last couple of months. We have had a couple of Coast Coral talks like this one. And we've also had a couple of bonus bites, which are, which are shorter, maybe 20, 30 minute talks um, of a number of topics. They're just little bite size of coastal corals, uh, which you can get all of these on Reef Tech Australia's YouTube channel, uh, website, or Facebook. You'll be able to find the information to source those if you want to rewatch any of them, because we do record um, these talks so that we can watch them later, you can watch them later, um, and that Ken has a copy of his presentation. Um, some upcoming events. This event is on tonight, actually at 8.30 um, on ABC, and it will be available on ABC iView. Um, it's following the East Australian Current, which I thought would be a cool little journey to go on. Um, this one is happening on Thursday night, or you can access it through WWF Australia's Facebook page. It's like a, it's a live streaming of this film. There's another couple of events. Uh, the Climate Council does a book club. Um, it's about every three weeks, I think. The next one is on sea light and, uh, sunlight and seaweed. And I thought that was interesting because we had Professor Nick Paul from USC talking about um, seaweed and its use for methane reduction for cattle feed. Um, so this book club will be uh, about this book, which I thought was interesting and relevant to the audience who listened to Nick's talk. 
Um, if any, if there's anyone on the Sunshine Coast who's a diver and doesn't know of this club, you should join. They've got a social meetup coming up um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, and that will be at Malula Bar. So you can jump on the Sunshine Coast Divers Facebook page for any more information. Ooh, Ken's going to talk to us about this. It's going to be very exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Um, they've got a dark sky light challenge where they're attempting to break a world record for the, correct me, Ken, the most number of people reporting light within a 24 hour period. So Ken's going to speak more to that a little bit later on, um, but it's a global event where all you need is a smartphone and an internet connection to take a Again, Ken will correct me if I'm wrong, but to take a photo of the sky wherever you live, and they're going to be mapping the pollution on a global scale, or lack of pollution, hopefully. Um, and our next coastal coral is going to be presented by Peter Davy on. Oh, ignore, ignore the text. I've got that wrong. Sorry. The correct date is the 14th of July. On the poster is the correct date. Um, Yep, so that's, as usual, the second Tuesday of every month. Um, he's going to be talking about crab diversity in Southeast Queensland. And you can always access the registration for our Coastal Corals are on the Reef Check Australia website, on the Get Involved tab, and then the calendar, and then that comes up with any upcoming events. Little shout out. So it was World Oceans Day yesterday, which is very exciting. And I came across this article today. Sorry about the blurry. It was just a screenshot from the news article. But there was estimated to be uh, 64,000 turtles swimming um, to lay, to start nesting, which is super exciting. And I just thought that was incredible footage. There's a video. Um, this was from news.com, but there's a few of them now. It was just released today, which is I thought super exciting and amazing to see how technology is allowing research to advance and get so much more accurate and faster, which is exciting. Um, and to Clay Coral, that's a local business who creates these earrings and other accessories um, from Biopolymer Clay. And she donates 10% of her profits to Reef Check Australia, um, which is a really uh, amazing initiative and it's a very generous thing for her to do. Um, and this week to celebrate World Oceans Day, she's got 25% off her whole range. So if you wanted to buy a gift for yourself or someone else, jump onto her website, claydecoral.com um, and yeah, grab a little bug and, and support Reef Check at the same time. And of course, thank you to all of our sponsors and supporters who help um, bring these events to life. We're very grateful for all of the support and we definitely could not do it without it. Um, and Ken, we'll be getting a little goodie bag to you with these uh, eco sustainable, sustainable products. Um, and thanks to these businesses um, who help us bring these goodie bags to our presenters who so generously donate their time. Um, and knowledge and expertise and passion. So we're so grateful for you tonight, Ken. Um, and we'll be passing this on to you somehow. We'll, get, we'll find a way, so we'll make that happen. And thank you to everyone um, behind the scenes at Reef Check Australia, the volunteers and the staff who make this happen. Um, it takes a village to bring these virtual events to life, uh, as you could all imagine and are probably doing in your own lives. Um, it's a whole new world that we're getting used to. So we're super grateful for the people who make this happen. And without further ado, we would love to welcome Dr. Ken Wishaw. He's gonna be talking to us about light pollution and its effect on us and the marine environment. Um, Ken is the co-founder of the Australasian Dark Sky Alliance. He's a longtime amateur astronomer, an avid scuba diver and marine nature lover. He recently completed postgraduate studies in light pollution at USQ, and tonight he'll be discussing how light pollution affects us and impacts marine, marine ecosystems, and he'll be teaching us a little bit about how to, um, how to notice good or bad uh, lighting and what we might be able to do to positively affect lights and then us and nature around us. Thanks for the invite, everybody, for uh, giving this talk. Um, I'll explain a little bit as to what, where I come from. You've, you've seen more of it, but I'll, I'll also go into what got me into this particular area of interest. So 
Yes, yeah, so I'm retired uh, specialist anaesthetist, and uh, my I work as an adjunct professor uh, on sessional basis at the University of Sunshine Coast for the Paramedic Sciences, and I'm also an honorary senior fellow at the university. Uh, I'm secretary of the Brisbane Astronomical Society, and I did postgraduate studies in astronomy and astrophysics at uh, University of Southern Queensland. Uh, member of International Dark Sky Association, and uh, last year helped found uh, an organisation called the Australasian Dark Sky Alliance. And uh, this basically is uh, a group of university academics, both from astronomy and biology and ecology, uh, and lighting experts. And uh, we basically exist to try and raise awareness about the problems of light pollution and uh, how to fix it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. So just to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about, uh, my core expertise in this is basically lighting physics and uh, human visual physiology. And so I'm going to really do the first half of the talk talking about that because it'll then set us up for seeing the obvious solutions when we get to the second half where we're going to talk about wildlife and what we can do about it. So um, by the end of the first half, you should be able to run rings around any so-called expert out there um, on this. You'll be able to run into any lighting shop or up to a lighting engineer and basically be able to uh, compete quite avidly when they tell you things that are quite ridiculous. And then in the second half, we'll go through the new national light pollution guidelines for wildlife uh, and tell you a bit about this world record attempt and how that all works. So we're going to start off with a bit of a poll and to, just for me to get an idea of what you know about lighting and light pollution. And we've got about eight slides to bring up and all I want is your first impression as to whether you think um, this is a good light or a bad light set up or whether you don't know or you're unsure. So it's just from a functional and a light pollution perspective, looking at slide A, is it Good, bad, or unsure. So if you'd like to fill that poll in, if it is up and running. Um, Karen, I can see your, oh yeah, sorry. It's just started. I was just gonna check that others could see it. Here we go. Okay, great. All right, we'll move on to the next one. Again, same, same question. Good, bad, unsure. And Ken, did you want people to take note of what answer they are Yes, selecting? I will actually revisit these slides uh, in about 10 minutes time and actually explain which ones are good and why, which ones are bad and why. So if you do want to actually write them down, these slides will come back up again. Awesome, um, thank you. Fairly soon. Thanks for reminding me. No worries. Okay. All right, I might leave it to one of you to make it work. Good, you're much better than I am at this. That's all right, Ken, I've got them coming up. Like we said earlier, it takes a village <laughs> to make these events <laughs> run smoothly, so we're happy to help where we can. Terrific, okay. Um, we'll, if you want to end that one, and we'll bring up the next one.
the highway banner. A little people are clearer on that one. <laughs> right, and next. Excellent. And that's the last one. Terrific. Excellent, okay. Let's move on. Great, thanks everybody. That gives me a good idea. So I always try and start with the end in mind. So this is the executive summary of the, uh, the entire night about lighting. If it's bright or it's got a high blue content, it's a bad light. And if you remember nothing more than that, you can now go to sleep because you've really got the take home message. But for those of you who are curious, I'll go a little bit further. So just to mention how I got into this, I. Um, after I had to retire because of an injury from clinical anesthesia, I actually shortly thereafter, um, after my kind of initial rehab, got to raft down the Grand Canyon in Arizona for the second time. Um, don't ask how you do that um, after you've had a back injury, but you do. Some things have to be done. Um, and once again, everybody apart from me and my wife uh, were from Florida, um, same as the previous trip I'd done 15 years earlier. And we were kind of around the campfire down the bottom of the Grand Canyon one evening. And I'd actually been thinking during the day, what could I do to kind of help the environment now that I had a bit more time on my hands and didn't really have some answers. I was thinking about reef checks and things like that, but still didn't come up with an answer. And we were around the campfire that night and it got out that I knew a bit about the constellations and it was a nice clear night. So they asked me to actually show some of them and like all, good astronomers I just happened to have a laser pointer in my pocket so I took that out and I started to show all the constellations to people and this lady you see in the front in the red jacket with the blonde hair she started crying and I thought what have I done here so I asked her if I'd offended her and she said no 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 this is this is I'm 42 and this is only the second night in my life I've ever seen a star and uh, I was I was blown away by that that thing and she said yes the first time is when I was 35 and uh, I lived in Florida all my life. It's the middle of Hurricane Katrina. It was two o'clock in the morning. I'm driving along the freeway to go keep my mother company and the entire Florida electricity grid went down. And instantly the orange dome that I'd lived under all my life disappeared and all the stars came out. So I just stopped the car in the middle of the freeway and got out and just looked up. And fortunately, everybody else on the freeway did exactly the same. Uh, so for 20 minutes, we had stars. Uh, no light pollution whatsoever. And then suddenly the grid came back up, the orange dome, orange dome came back, and she said, I've been saving my money ever since to come out to the Grand Canyon so I can have a second night in my life seeing stars. And that's what really gave me the answer. I, I just took it for granted that um, everybody could see stars and see the Milky Way. And I thought, well, maybe they can't. Um, and, you know, I had always thought that I'd be able to say my children, the Grand grandchildren, kind of the Milky Way, and show them the giant emu that the Aborigines talk about in the sky. Um, and this is a composite picture taken up in Mullaney, uh, the Southern Cross is over here. And if you want to see the giant emu, that the head of the emu and its beak is just there. And then here's its long neck down here, and then the body of the emu is here. So this is a 270 degree photo. So this thing spreads right across the entire sky, but you have to have pristine dark to be able to see it. And the more I looked, the more worried I thought that the Sunshine Coast is actually gonna lose this in the next few years if somebody doesn't stand up and try and stop the inevitable march of bright LED lights coming up from Brisbane. So that's what got me into it. 
So what we're talking about is artificial lighting at night or what we often abbreviate to Allen. This is a picture of uh, Los Angeles. And again, you can see the typical orange dome that these people live under. In 1994, they had a power failure during an earthquake at 4.30 in the morning. And everybody rushed out on the, the streets. And there were hundreds of phone calls made to the police and to the local observatory to kind of warn them of an alien invasion. They could see all the spaceships and they are dropping a cloud across Los Angeles to poison everybody. And all they were seeing was, was the stars in the Milky Way. Um, so it is amazing how we just take it for granted and it's something that probably 90% of the world's population in first world cannot see. It's the stars that we get to enjoy up here. So let's talk a little bit about, we'll start with the light pollution. Um, this is uh, two photos. So the top photo was taken in Kenilworth, the bottom photo down in Maroochydore. Um, the, taken on subsequent nights, same weather conditions, same camera, same exposure settings, uh, et cetera, They're unretouched. The only difference is the light pollution. So you can actually start to see what we are missing, uh, even here in Maroochydore, compared to what we could see um, if the lights were all turned out. And it is basically, it's the blue and the green content of the lights that causes the problem. Uh, it's the blue and the green, uh, the shorter wavelength light that scatters. That's why the sky is blue. Um, and that is the part that causes 90% of the light pollution. And you can see that well demonstrated here. This is taken from the International Space Station that comes over Portugal and Spain. And you can see that only the orange and red light actually gets through the atmosphere from the surface up to the International Space Station while the green and the blue gets filtered out and scattered, causing that halo you see up at the top. And that's what causes the light pollution or what we call sky glow that prevents us seeing the, the stars at night. So that's, that's the actual problem that we have from a night sky vision point of view. So now I'm gonna go on to talk a little bit about human health um, and how uh, light is negatively impacting on human health. We've had this problem of sleep disturbance and it's dramatically increased over the last 10 to 15 years. And LED lights are a big reason as to why it's been occurring. So I'll just talk a little bit about sleep disturbance and circadian rhythm and how that all occurs. Over millions of years, plants and animals have all developed to actual function optimally uh, with a circadian day-night rhythm. Uh, in plants, uh, the day-night rhythm is uh, created or is controlled by hormones called auxins, uh, whereas in animals, it's basically melatonin uh, that basically causes it. And what happens is that melatonin is our sleep hormone. So when we have high levels of melatonin, uh, that's when we get the sleepiness, the low activity, and during the day, the melatonin is, is suppressed. And so we get our wakefulness and our higher activity. To explain just why that happens, what actually turns the melatonin on and off, we just have to do a little bit of simple physics here. So this is a curve, it sounds, sounds fancy, but in fact, it's very simple. This is called a power spectrum curve. Talk to any lighting person or lighting expert and say that, you know, I'd like to see the power spectrum curve, please. They'll be quite impressed because not many people know what it actually means. But all it is is a very simple graph. It shows you the the spectrum of the light that you're looking at and the height of the graph tells you what the intensity or the brightness of each particular light is. So this is, is daylight. You can see it's a nice even spectrum um, right across from infrared up to ultraviolet. And the most, uh, the, the strongest, the brightest part of it is in the blue part of the spectrum. And that makes sense because it basically it's, it's the color blue of the sky that's causing that intensity. And the way we suppress melatonin and induce wakefulness is that it's the light, the, the color of the blue sky uh, that actually uh, coming through that suppresses the melatonin. So it's picked up by receptors in the eye, uh, which release a little sub hormone, which suppresses the melatonin. And as you will see, I kind of tend to think of light emitting diodes as being frenemies because 
there's some really good things you can do with them, but they have some really bad things. So we'll start with the bad. So this is the power spectrum. Uh, have a look at the one on the left, the cool white LED. Um, and you can see that it has this enormous blue spike right at the melatonin suppression uh, wavelength. And this is largely uh, what is kind of the light component of sleep disturbance that is occurring is that blue thing. Because remember that we have LEDs in our computers, in our TV screens, our phones, and all those sort of things, which unless we take specific action to stop it, we cop that, that blue spike um, at night, and that causes significant sleep depression, uh, sleep disturbance. So let's talk a little bit about white LEDs. Now, here's your typical Christmas tree with all the different colored LEDs, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And you would think that basically you could put all those different colors, the blues, the greens, the oranges, the reds, all together and create white light. But in fact, you can't. What you end up with is because they're very discrete frequencies, you end up with a really funny color mix and particularly pastel colors just look weird as you can actually see in the background of this photo. But the way that white LEDs actually create white light is that they combine blue and yellow. Uh, and it is actually an optical illusion that we perceive it as white. And it's got to do with the way that our retinas in the back of our eyes are actually wired up that we see it as white. So if you could actually do a cross section of a white LED, you would actually find that inside is a blue LED, just the same color as those intense blue lights on your Christmas lights, like the background of this slide. And then there's a phosphor coating put on the outside. So they engineer that phosphor coating to allow some of the blue to come through and some of it to be converted to yellow. And then when you combine the two in your eye, it appears as white. So that's why you get that funny wavelength you see down the bottom with that blue spike. And just to kind of show how this works, this is actually a white LED out of the ceiling of my own, own place. Now I'll take the cover off and you can see in there, it's got all these little chips. So the outer chips, um, which are marked C for cool, uh, they're the ones that are actually let a lot of blue through, so they give the cool white impression. Uh, the inner chips have got an orange phosphor, and so those are the warm white ones. So the blue is basically filtered completely out, almost completely out of those inner ones. And on the back of this particular LED, there's a three-way switch. So I can either have just cool white by having just the yellow ones working, or just uh, warm white by having the orange ones only working, or I can have the lot and have something in the middle. So I've got it, the switch set at warm white. So basically, I, by just doing that and only using the orange chips, so I'd fill about 95% of the blue light uh, inside my unit by doing that. And um, by and large, most of the white LEDs coming out these days are tricolor LEDs. But the bad news doesn't stop there. Sure, we've got problems with sleep disturbance, but there are other human health effects of blue light and melatonin suppression. So sleep disturbance kind of leads on to somnolence during the day, which leads to obesity, um, which is part of the reason why we get an increased incidence of diabetes and heart disease in people exposed to excessive amounts to blue light. Um, but there are some other mechanisms happening there as well. Uh, which we don't fully understand. There also is a correlation between um, excessive exposure to blue frequencies of light throughout your 24 hour cycle and increases in breast, prostate and bowel cancer. And that is reasonably well understood at a genetic level. Melatonin is a very, what we call a very ancient hormone. It actually has, apart from its day night rhythm effects, it has about 27 other different effects in the body. And it has a pretty strong function on the immune response. So if you suppress melatonin, you're actually causing uh, fairly widespread immune suppression as well. And we think that is why uh, the breast, prostate and bowel cancer is higher in people who have excessive exposure uh, to blue light at night. So I'll just move on to a little bit about lighting and crime. Um, the electricity companies and a lot of the lighting companies would love to convince you that uh, bright lights prevent crime and keep you safe. 
but the good quality scientific article um, research has never been able to prove that. Um, sometimes it's actually the opposite, most of the time it's the same, but there's basically no good evidence to show that it actually improves uh, crime rates and improves safety. The energy companies and the lighting people have now realised that, so they've they've taken their kind of spiel over from saying that it actually does to actually you should have bright lights because it gives you a perception of safety because that's all they can say because there actually is no real uh, improvement in safety or crime. Uh, and in fact, if you look at that picture there, if I was um, a bad person looking to assault somebody out of the street, that's the driveway I would pick because I could sit just outside the beams of those lights Anybody walking out that driveway would be totally night blind and totally vulnerable uh, to being attacked. I could stand just a few feet outside that, uh, that light and you'd never see me. So it's actually counterintuitive. So I suppose what I'm saying is that bright is not beautiful and we do not have to buy into what the lighting companies and the energy companies would like us to do in terms of lights. And it's really up to us to change this around. So what do we do about it? So there are basically four things we can do, and we'll just go through uh, the first three now. Uh, they are fairly intuitive. And the beauty about LED lights, even though they potentially have this horrible blue problem, uh, is that all of these technology, all these ideas we can use to prevent the problem are very easily done with LED lights, much easier than uh, older generation lights. So the first one is basically what we call dimming and motion activation. So the older style lights, particularly outdoor lights like the mercury vapor lights uh, and the um, sodium vapor lights, you can't dim them without damaging the lights. So generally they burn all night um, because they just can't, can't turn them down. But LED lights actually like to be dimmed. They last a lot longer if you actually dim them. And when you restart them up, there's no lag time. They'll come up full brightness instantly. So they're actually, they're actually perfect for using for motion activation. So the picture here actually shows what we call smart or intelligent lighting. So you only have the lights come on through motion activation where they're needed and when they're not needed, uh, they can be turned off. Um, and you can set these things up so that they're actually, when we talk about the intelligent lighting, that they actually send messages to the other light poles. So you can have lights coming on 50, 100 meters in front of you and turning off 50 or 100 meters behind you but still having a massive decrease in the amount of total light that's being used. And there's a couple of other advantages of this too, um, in that it saves not only electricity, but it saves a, a heck of a lot of money. So I live in a high rise unit with uh, 70 units here, and I got permission a year ago to actually rip out all the old uh, style lights, the fluorescence and the halogens and replace them with an intelligent LED lighting system. Um, that has cost us $20,000 to do. I haven't, I've still about three quarters of the way through the project, but uh, yes, $20,000 we've spent so far, but we're actually saving $1,200 a month in electricity bills. And uh, the second thing is that uh, ultimately most lights use coal as their power source. And so if you can decrease the electricity consumption, you can decrease the actual carbon dioxide production. So we've just got back our estimates, um, our calculations, and showed that we've actually decreased our carbon footprint by 15 tonnes of CO2 every month since going over to a intelligent lighting system. So it pays for itself and it's good for the environment, it's good for us. So the second solution that you can have is make sure that you use lights that are shielded. And so that means that basically nothing is going up above horizontal. The light is going down to where it's needed. There, there is no point in trying to light up the air or light up the International Space Station from underneath. They have their own lights, thank you very much. Um, put the lights where they need to go and limit it to that. It can be a little bit hard to find good shielded lights, but um, this is one of the things that the ADSA is doing is actually putting out lists of lights that uh, meet our criteria. And the third solution basically is to only buy warm white lights. Well, how do you do that? Um, the easiest way is that all the LED lights at the moment have what's called a Kelvin rating written on the box or written on the luminaire itself. Um, and what you want to do is make sure that you're buying lights that are 3000 Kelvin or less. 
four or five years ago uh, when uh, the lighting companies and that were pushing the bright light agenda, it was very hard to find LED lights under 4,000 Kelvin. But with kind of community and public pressure, 3,000 have become more common. And in fact, 2,700 Kelvin uh, are generally available. And we're even seeing 2,200 Kelvin coming up. There is no visual advantage to anything above 3,000 Kelvin. Uh, we hit kind of optimum color um, perception of that at 3,000 Kelvin. So anything above that is actually not doing anything from a functional point of view. From a uh, you know, friendliest point of view, I've put up these two pictures of, of two bars. I think I'd rather be in the left bar with the nice warm lights than this one on the right with the 5,000 Kelvin lighting, which to me seems very kind of cold and uninviting. Personal preference, but that's the way I feel. Um, my last research thing I did was looking at what is the optimum color uh, for humans for being able to perceive in the dark. Uh, in fact, orange is the best. So we've actually got a win-win uh, situation here. And this one of the things I really like about light pollution is there aren't any compromises. So unlike a lot of other forms of pollution, the moment you flick the switch, the pollution stops. So we can instantly fix this. The second thing is we're not compromising. So we see best in orange by avoiding the blue. Uh, we minimize sky glow by avoiding the blue. Uh, and as you'll see, we minimize the effects on wildlife by avoiding the blue. And by decreasing our light footprint, we are decreasing um, the carbon dioxide we're putting out and we're putting money back in our hip pockets. And uh, it's nice to have something where it's win-win all around. So just in closing off this bit, I'll go back to the pictures that we polled. So this is, this is number A. Um, we had basically half of people thinking this was bad lighting. Do people want to have another go at it? Oh, right, okay. Still unsure, but we're getting more bads. Okay. So this actually is an example of bad lighting. It looks stylish, uh, but from a functionality point of view, the glare's straight into your eyes. So trying to pick up that path, and particularly when it's a black path with green in between, it's gonna be uneven. Um, functionally, it doesn't, doesn't do what it needs to do. So you'd be fairly night blind in that. Secondly, they're using cold white light, which is, uh, not, which is going above the horizontal, so it ticks all the bad boxes, that one. Another common outdoor light you will see is this sort of globe or what we term as a light bomb um, with exactly the same problems. It's just spewing light everywhere. Um, and these are notoriously bad from a light pollution point of view. Okay, so what about this one? We had about 50-50 split initially. Now we're seeing a lot more good. Okay, people are, that's good. Okay, so this is actually good lighting um, because you can see that all the lighting uh, is directed down. There's no light going up above the horizontal. Um, it's a bit hard to tell the actual color of the lighting there, but the chief thing is it's fully shielded lighting. So it's not gonna be contributing to light pollution at all. Excellent. Okay, this one again. So about two thirds of people thought this was bad lighting. Okay, so apply the things. Is it fully shielded? Is it warm white or cold white? We can't really kind of comment as to whether it's motion activated or not. But basically this is bad lighting again. It's just spewing light in every direction. So festering lights, uh, a bad, bad. Your neighbors don't like it. The possums don't like it. Nobody likes it. So it's uh, not an example of good lighting at all. Here's an alternative. Um, this is actually um, the lights around the pool where I live, uh, which are actually solar powered. 
um, and they're three thousand, they're two thousand seven hundred Kelvin, and they they purely go down forty five degrees below the horizontal. And another example of of good outdoor lighting, where you can see it's it looks good, it's functional, it's putting the light where it's needed, but it's keeping all the light down well below horizontal. Okay, this one on the side of the highway. Good or bad? Yeah, that's pretty easy to pick. This one's not good. So the big problem with this is that it's being lit from below. So all the lights are either going straight up into the sky or they're reflecting off the billboard and up into the sky. And it's, I suppose, a little bit ironic that they're trying to advertise the beauty of the Milky Way. But if you look into the back of the billboard, you can see there's no hope of seeing the Milky Way because of that orange light pollution glow behind. Um, so we're never going to get rid of billboards, but what we can do is we can light them from above so that the light's all going down. Why don't they all do this? Um, it's just dollars and cents. It, it costs more money to actually service lights that are up the top and the, down the bottom of the billboard. But uh, feel free to write to anybody who um, um, lights from below and tell them they should be doing the right thing. Okay, this one. Do you want to poll that one? Good, yeah. This is great lighting. With, with one minor exception. So all the lighting is under the bench or under the stairs. Um, if you look, you can't really see it in this, but in a higher resolution, you can see that all they're needing to actually be able to see around there is a few candles um, because people are maintaining their own night vision uh, rather than having it destroyed. The only negative is, is the tree um, because uh, lighting the tree from below is actually uh, putting up light above horizontal, but there's a lot of foliage on the tree. So, you know, they're, they're probably not having too much an effect there, but yeah, lighting up trees from below is not a great idea. And finally, this one. Yep, bad lighting again. You can see the glare from, you know, the lights that are a kilometer down the road. Uh, it's very much towards the blue end of the spectrum. It's way in excess of what you need. And again, you can see the orange sky glow up above. Unfortunately, uh, here in Southeast Queensland, this is the most common um, light that we see, the metal halide lights, um, in that they are very much in the blue spectrum. Uh, they are unshielded. Um, they are a big cause of most of our light pollution uh, that we get uh, from street lights. Uh, Energex put these in because they're very cheap to purchase and very expensive to run. And 97% of Energex's um, income comes from the electricity the council pays to run these things. Um, so uh, they are not good lights at all. What you really want to see if you're going to do street lights is again, get down to the orange and use fully shielded lights. Okay, so that's the end of the first half of the talk. And I just sort of this stage, I'll stop for any questions before we go into the wildlife side of things. And my chat Thanks, thing. Thanks, Ken. Has... That was absolutely brilliant. We've got your son, Daniel, on the chat answering most of the questions. So thank you, Daniel, for that. It's been brilliant to have him in there. Yes, there are two questions, um, one from Shai. Uh, and he asked, does light power need to be minimised as well or only colour? So we, we want to decrease the brightness as well. Um, the, and we'll get into a little bit about this very shortly when I'm talking about turtles. Um, that although the blue is the major culprit, all uh, parts of the spectrum uh, do cause the same problems. Uh, to give you a kind of semi-quantitative idea, if you have a 3,000 Kelvin lighting and a 4,000 Kelvin light of same light output, the 4,000 Kelvin light puts out, in terms of causing sky glow, causes about four to five times as much as the 3,000. But right. you still will get uh, problems uh, with different species. And I'll talk about that in a sec with uh, the reds and the oranges. Uh, so right. yeah, we okay. want to decrease the brightness as well as change the color. 
And we've got, is there a um, Max Lumens recommendation you have? Um, yeah, this is where I'm not a, a light engineer and can't give you the, uh, the precise things, but basically you need about, in general areas, you need about 80 to 90 lux. And if you've got a, a study area um, or an eating area, you tend to get around 120, 130 lux. Um, and I've, I've done some measurements around this unit. I've gone into people's houses or people's units here who have lit up their place to an excess of 300 lux. And they don't need more light bulbs. They actually need their cataracts out. <laughs> right. And I'm not surprised um, about this question from Renee. Um, she's asking, what can someone like myself do if they notice bad lights in the apartment complex where they live? Uh, body corporates always talk dollars and cents. So if you want your body corporate to talk to me and tell them how much they could save, um, very happy to do it. Okay. We've, I had a lot of people doubting this program that I was doing and we were spending a lot of money and now they've seen the electricity bills coming in and they've all gone. Oh my God, this is amazing. We, we really didn't think you could do this. Um, so yeah, happy to talk wow. to anybody corporate. <laughs> That's good to know. We'll, we'll have to have your number on file, Ken. We've got another one about city planners. Um, Shai is asking, do they consider brighter white lights because of safety concerns and drivers falling asleep behind the wheel at night? For some reason, Traffic engineers like 4,000 Kelvin, and it makes very little sense. And, and I have talked to them about this, and unfortunately, it's often talk, like talking to a brick wall, because we've had the high-pressure sodium, those orange lights we've had for years, they're 2,200 Kelvin, and they're fine. Um, there is, as I said, there's no reason to be more than, than 3,000 Kelvin. Um, there is an idea that you actually should kind of have brighter lights at intersections uh, and use 4,000 Kelvin on pedestrian crossings as a way of jolting people's awareness. And I've, I don't have a problem with that, providing they're shielded. Um, but, you know, we have a thing on cars for seeing things in the dark called headlights. And we actually, to use headlights plus bright street lighting actually makes things harder to see rather than easier. Um, so there, there's not a lot of sense uh, as to why they like 4,000 Kelvin. There's certainly not a visual or a human physiology basis behind it. Right, isn't that interesting? We've got a few questions about our mobile phone light. Um, one from Susie who's asking, I have my laptop and mobile phone on night mode after 6 p.m. Does this eliminate the blue lights of the screens? Yes. Um, there been, there's been two approaches to dealing with that. There's one is where you actually put in things like in the Apple world, it's called f.lux is, is the, the, the app. Um, but PCs and Androids and that all have their own things. And they actually do work. Uh, there's good data to show them. There's also been a push for wearing orange glasses um, after sunset. And it's been shown that actually changing, altering the screen is vastly more effective than the glasses. Um, I actually have an orange filter on, on the front of my Kindle so I can read that in the middle of the night without blowing my melatonin. But yes, they do work. Highly recommend. Right. Uh, and Pablo is asking, um, how early should I be switching my phone light from blue to red at night? And how many hours do I need to give my eyes before I can sleep? The, if you are kind of staying in the daylight mode, which typically on these things is about 5,500 Kelvin, um, it can, it certainly has dramatic effects for 15 to 20 minutes and it can be up to an hour before you actually, if, after you turn them off, before your melatonin levels start to come back to normal. Right. Uh, and we've got Harry here asking, could an excess of bright lights on road strain and damage eyes after prolonged periods? For example, long distance driving at night. The intensity of the light is probably not uh, enough, but we do know that the use of the high intensity LED lights within units and on bright computer screens actually does 
uh, increase the incidence of uh, macular degeneration uh, in, in old age, um, which I didn't want to get into to add too many things, but uh, the ophthalmologists and the optometrists are really seeing a dramatic increase in that, and there's good correlation between uh, using cool white LEDs and macular degeneration. So no, it's not good for your eyes at all. Right, there um, you go. You can, you can look at the converse in China, um, where they found that they had a lot of problems with people who were myopic or short-sighted. And they figured out about five to 10 years ago that it was actually due to a lack of exposure to blue light during the day. And so by enforcing kids getting out into the sunshine during the day for at least an hour each day, they've decreased their short-sightedness in their young population by about 70%. Wow, okay. Well, we'll let you get back to it, Ken. Um, but if anyone else has any other burning questions, pop them in the chat and um, Ken can get to them at the, the end of his talk. So thanks, Ken. Okay. So let's move on to the National Light Pollution Guidelines uh, and the effects on wildlife. So these guidelines came out um, in January and uh, we should be able to give you the link. Um, for this, it is an amazing document, this. It's about 170 pages long. I wouldn't suggest that you read it from cover to cover. I have, but uh, it's almost like an encyclopedia. What are the effects and what to do about it? Um, as I said, it, it's an Australian um, publication. Uh, and part of the reason that we're doing stuff with the ADSA is we're trying to really promote this particular set of guidelines out there. Um, they are guidelines, so they're not enforceable at law, but um, they, they do kind of link to a, quite a lot of other legislation. Probably the biggest thing that came out of these is they are saying that if you are building a new building or outdoor lighting structure that's within 20 kilometers of a habitat of endangered species, you should be doing an environmental impact study um, because it refers to quite a lot of data showing that uh, light pollution uh, can, can affect uh, habitats up to 20 kilometres from the source of the light. From a physics point of view, we know that you can detect light pollution up to 300 kilometres away. But in terms of on wildlife, it's good, good evidence up to 20 kilometres away. So there's plenty of bits of the Sunshine Coast that are within 20 kilometres of the coast. So um, it's quite sobering to see those numbers coming out. So in terms of thinking about wildlife, we've got to also remember that uh, different species have uh, different perceptions of colours. A lot of animal species see a lot more into the blue, the violet, the ultraviolet than we do, um, and uh, are affected in different ways. And just because we can't see the light doesn't mean it doesn't have an effect. Kind of the, the iconic kind of concept is the ones of, of turtles and how lights affect them. And basically, as far as the turtles go, uh, the adults uh, tend not to want to nest uh, where there is light pollution. Um, great examples in Florida, where there's a lot of beaches with the shadows of high rise buildings, and they notice that the, they kind of miss the gaps between the buildings and only go where the building's casting shadow over the beach. Um, so that the, the adult females will either, if they hit light, they will just turn around and go back off the beach or they won't even come in and lay at all. Now, the emerging hatchlings, when they come out, they have to orientate themselves as to which way to the ocean. And the way they do that is that they, they kind of walk away from a high dark horizon and towards a low light horizon. And it's actually got nothing to do with the moon whatsoever. Um, so if there are lights behind the beach, or even if there are clouds behind the beach that are being lit up by buildings you know, some kilometres back from the beach, that will be enough to disorientate the hatchlings and they'll go inland rather than out to sea. So we also know that once they're in the water, if there are boats out on the water, you know, a bunch of night divers or whatever, um, who've got lights on, that the hatchlings will actually go there and they'll just circle around, 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 the boat rather than swimming out to deep water where they're safe. 
there is no such thing as turtle friendly lighting. Uh, it is very much the blue end of the spectrum that affects them the most, but they are still attracted to red and orange lights. So anybody who tells you that there is a thing called turtle friendly lighting, uh, it's not true. We talk about it being turtle aware lighting, which is get it to the orange and red end of the spectrum and turn it off and fully shield it uh, when you don't need it. Quite a few seabirds are affected by um, artificial light at night. Um, so the common problems that they get disorientated by the, the flights. Uh, there is decreased chick feeding. A lot of the adults will not come back to a nest if there's artificial light around. Um, and there's can be failure of the fledglings to leave the nest or the nest area. And the shear wood, waters uh, or the mutton birds who live in the burrows, uh, the fledglings have actually, they only have one source of light, which is the, the entrance to the burrow. So they get to associate the light with where food comes from. So when they go out at night, they're meant to all fly off at night um, out to sea. Um, if there are lights around, they'll just turn around, they'll go straight to the artificial lights and nestle down under the lights and not kind of set out to see where they're meant to go. The other thing is that the fledglings in these uh, seabirds need to imprint the location of the colony and they can't do that in the presence of artificial lights and therefore they won't know how to return uh, back to their colony uh, as adults. Um, artificial light at night also affects the migratory shorebirds and there's quite a few threatened species here in Australia. Again, disorientation during flight is a problem. Um, and there can be a, a disruption of their nocturnal feeding patterns. Um, and some of them actually gain an advantage out of the artificial lights and what, what bugs and that get uh, attracted, but the vast majority of them are worse off with artificial lighting around as well. Um, also, they don't like to nest near the artificial light. So if their feeding ground is close to light affected places like you see in the photo there, um, they'll nest further away and this affects their energy balance. But these birds are trying to fatten up for flying all the way back to Siberia and it's critical that they have uh, the max amount of energy storage on board. So if they're spending more time getting from their nest to the feeding areas, this can um, uh, have a very nasty effect on them because they just don't have sufficient calories for the big flights. So I actually look out over a uh, migratory shorebird habitat at Maroochydore. Uh, what I've done is I had a, um, a high energy using oyster light, which you see up the top there. So I took that, took that down and I put in a, um, an LED light, which only goes up to 45 degrees from vertical. Um, and then I picked one that was big enough to actually get a piece of plumber's pipe and make myself a little hat for it as well. Uh, so that this thing doesn't cast any light uh, onto the ocean and not, none at all onto the island whatsoever. And we are going to be changing the entire uh, block of units over this sort of fully shielded lighting. So quite a few other species are affected. It's not just uh, the marine species or clownfish. They show that their eggs don't hatch um, if they're exposed to too much artificial light at night. I'm not quite sure where that would actually happen, but it is a biological fact. The wallabies, uh, another example, because they've found that with exposure to artificial light at night, they delay their reproduction. So when the babies finally come out of the pouch, they're coming out at the wrong time of the year for food sources. Even a little dung beetle is affected. The dung beetle on moonless nights actually uses the Milky Way to orientate itself. And how they do these experiments are quite fascinating. Um, they put little visors on the dung beetle's eyes and see whether they can still go in a straight line at night and they can't. They just go around around circles. So um, the mountain pygmy possums is a, a really sad one. We've seen about a 90% decrease in mountain pygmy possums in the Snowy Mountains in the last few years. And we think that a significant part of this actually is a loss of their food source, which is the bogon moths, which are tending to be attracted to the lights of Canberra rather than flying on during their migration to the Snowy Mountains. So the 
the guidelines that I talked about, which I recommend you to read, were actually presented at the 13th International Convention on Preservation of Migratory Species this year. Uh, and 130 countries have adopted the Australian guidelines, which I think just really is great testimony to what a fantastic document it is. The irony, I suppose, is this is the building where that, that was adopted. And it is probably the worst example of light pollution for a building that I've ever seen in my life, but so be it. So one of the things we're doing at the Australasian Dark Sky Alliance is we've actually set up a system of proving lighting. So what we do is we get lighting manufacturers, you think they've got a good light pollution type light, who actually submit it to us, we get it independently tested. And depending on those results, we actually uh, give them an approval. We don't get any kickback or anything this, we don't make a cent out of this. We just want people like lighting engineers and councils to be able to find lights that they know will be good um, for the outdoors. So we have three categories. We've got the basic ones, which are less than 3000 Kelvin, no upward light, um, and no spillage front and back. Yeah. Our next level is what we call the ADSA prize. You see these ones are 2700 Kelvin and CCT and Kelvin are the same thing. But we've also added in there that if you try and tilt this light up to its maximum angle, it still won't go above horizontal. And thirdly, our prize to wildlife ones um, are 2,700 Kelvin. And we've added in this thing of 2% blue content because there's some lights that can actually have a low Kelvin rating and still have a lot of blue. And I'll just show you how that works. So this is a power spectrum curve. And believe it, this here is a 2,700 Kelvin light with a huge blue spike. And the reason it comes in as a 2,700 Kelvin is because it's got that big red spike as well. This is the light you use for going marijuana. Uh, fantastic, have it in your basement by all means, but don't take it outside. So in the ADSA prize wildlife, we actually, we actually look at the power spectrum curves of all of these lights so that we don't get stuff like this sneaking through. And to give you an idea of what it looks like, uh, this is a project that one of the ADSA lighting engineers recently did down in lawn system. So you can see that you've got more than enough light to, to go along that pathway because your night vision is preserved. You can see everything around you. You can see the lights on the other side of the river. You can see stars and everything. There's nothing wrong with that lighting. Uh, and this is what we want to see. And that's what we're trying to push. So by now, hopefully you might see that I'm alluding to what the fourth one is here, and that is to raise awareness. The vast majority of people, when you tell them about this stuff, don't argue and say it's wrong or it's, I don't like it. They basically said, I just wasn't aware of it. What do I do? And that's what we're all about. So what we're going to do to raise awareness is that the federal government came to us with the release of the National Light Pollution Guidelines, asking how could we do that? So we've decided that we're going to try and do a Guinness Book of World Records uh, thing about light pollution. And so we're actually doing it and that the title of it is the world's largest online sustainability lesson about light pollution. And it's sponsored by, uh, partially by the federal government um, and a number of other people. Uh, the reason Lidcom Public School are there is because our main video, which is only about three minutes long and covers virtually everything I've just talked about, is done by three 10 year olds who won a national competition last year for a light pollution project uh, with this animated video. Um, so very much a family friendly sort of uh, experience. So the world record attempt is basically, it's gonna be easy. You don't need any astronomical knowledge. It's family friendly because you do it at home. You don't need to go anywhere. Uh, and it's COVID-19 safe, how's good? It's what it's going to be is on June the 21st, uh, after 3 p.m., we'll make available um, via our websites uh, a half hour uh, session, which involves a couple of short videos and some fairly straightforward questions on light pollution. And then you'll get a video of me teaching people how to actually do light pollution readings with your iPhone or your iPad. Um, you don't need anything else more than that. 
So we're really after as many people as possible to go on uh, to our website. As soon as you go onto the homepage, it'll, it'll redirect you after a few seconds. Uh, you can register, you can do it for free. Um, Guinness Book of World Records are charging $6,000 plus for their services. So if you feel like pitching in $3 to help us pay for that, that would be good, but you don't have to. Um, and also we want to get over to the idea that this doesn't start and stop on the 21st of June. We want people to go out and spread the word uh, to be, continue to use uh, the Globe at Night app uh, on their phones. So whenever they're anywhere and they just think, oh, okay, what am I going to do for now? You know, in two minutes, you can actually put a light pollution thing onto the international database. Um, and there are other videos um, on our site as to how you can actually get your hands on all the data from around the world uh, that goes onto that, that database and actually compare where you are, see your own readings, see everybody else's readings, uh, and just get an idea of what light pollution is like. So basically I'll finish there. Um, you know, these are all the formulas you need to uh, protect ourselves, protect the skies, protect the wildlife, and hopefully we can prevent this little guy here from having a brighter future. So I'll hand it over to questions. Thanks, Ken. That was absolutely brilliant. And hopefully we can get a few of the people from tonight attending that Guinness World Record. How exciting. Um, we have a question from Daniel here and um, your son. <laughs> and he's asking, how do you think the local councils are doing with outdoor lighting and where would you like to see it improved? Um, and really interestingly, he says, would it be a good idea to give council area a light report card equivalent to the river health scorecard or is there a better mechanism? That, that is a really, really good idea. What an intelligent guy. Um, <laughs> the Must run in the family. Yeah, the, I'll start with the Sunshine Coast Council. The Sunshine Coast Council has put a lot of money, time and effort in over the last five or six years to try and get dark sky lighting throughout the area, particularly for their outdoor and their street lighting. Um, they did a, a major report back in 2016. And the problem that they face is that for all existing uh, areas, not new development, but all existing ones up until then, they don't actually own the streetlights. They're owned by uh, Energex or what is now Energy Queensland. So they don't actually have a say in what streetlights go in. Uh, and the whole idea is that the Sunshine Coast Council committed themselves to actually buying all those streetlights off Energy Queensland, trashing a lot of them and putting in International Dark Sky Association lights. And um, it got knocked back. They then were able to get 13 of the South East Queensland councils to come on board with the idea and they all approached um, Energy Queensland of the government um, as a united front and again, got knocked back. So it's not actually the councils that are uh, the problem. Any new developments in Sunshine Coast Council like uh, Aura down south of Caloundra, Caloundra South, uh, the council does own the streetlights. And if you go down to Aura, they actually put in fantastic streetlights, as Daniel knows, um, because the council got to say what goes in them. So they are IDA compliant lights and any new development here on the coast basically has to have IDA compliant. But trying to convince Energy Queensland to not use brighter lights and inappropriate lights, particularly as it doesn't, the idea of intelligent lighting does not fit with their budgetary strategy is basically the words they use to me. They want us oh. using as much electricity as possible. Um, and it's really frustrating. Far as Noosa Council goes, I don't know where they rank compared to Sunshine Coast Council. Um, and I don't really know what the answer is. Uh, one of the things that I'm working on is trying to get a da international dark sky reserve uh, in the Mullaney to Kenilworth region, which hopefully would give us um, kind of enough armament to go to the political heads of government and say, please do not put in inappropriate lighting in there when you put in new street lights. Um, I, yeah, the, the report card doesn't need to go to the councils. The report card needs to go to Energy Queensland and the Queensland government. That's, that's the bottom line, I think. 
Right. Okay. Um, Vic brought up an, an interesting topic on um, clownfish uh, nearby island resorts and it attracted a little bit of attention with Renee asking if there's any known impacts on light pollution there. And um, we have Rachel asking in regards to dive sites um, with divers having a lot of night lights um, on during their night dives and whether the strobe lighting from photos has any effect on clownfish that you know of. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, not my area of expertise. Um, <laughs> I am blown away by the brightness of lights of divers. You know, to me, a light should be bright enough and no more. And when I see people going down with lights that are kind of, you know, are trying to do kind of like, you know, Sydney Stadium, um, it really worries me. And you can certainly see the change in behaviour um, that some fish will actually use that to advantage, uh, to hit other night blind fish. I've certainly seen it a lot on the reef. Uh, you will actually, there are places where I've had a cluster of the, uh, the higher predators just hanging off your shoulders waiting for you to stun a small fish and then they'll just start in and, and take it. Um, so I'm very much of, you know, use enough light to see what you need and no more. Right. We have a few divers in here, so they might have a few comments to add to that one in the chat. We've got a question from Harry um, and he's asking for small mammals in urban areas, how would you help protect them from light pollution as they will be at ground level with lights being directly above them? I, th I think the things there basically is is to, to keep them at the warm colours and basically motion activate them. One of the big frustrations I've got at the moment is that um, to finish my lighting project here, I'm trying to get made a fully shielded um, 2700 Kelvin light with a motion activa activation uh, lens in it. And such a thing doesn't exist on the market. Uh, but I have um, a group actually in the process of designing it but unfortunately they happen to be in Wuhan province where they design all this stuff. So I'm at the bottom of the totem pole of priorities at the moment. Um, <laughs> but I, I have a lot of places. I've um, high rise units. Um, there's a lot of, nearly all the houses in the Bunya mountains are waiting on me to get this light into reality. Uh, it's unbelievably frustrating that they don't exist, but again, it's, uh, it's consumer pressure. Um, but yeah, motion activation on the lights, I think is a big thing for the wildlife. And right. this idea of leaving the lights on all night because it makes the place safer is just, just no proof to it. Motion activation is much better. Right, okay. Uh, for the divers out there, Vicky's put um, a little bit of information in there about um, using photography while you're diving. And Gina is asking, do cruise ships have any regulations on their lighting systems that they have to implement? Um, she says she's seen lots that have large lights that shine directly into the water. Don't know. I've got an opinion about it, but I don't know whether there's any legislation about it. <laughs> I don't right. know. I know exactly what you mean because I see them go past here, or I used to. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of environmental studies that we could do with what's happened in the last six months. That could be one of them. Right, there you go. Some, some of the students out there that want to pick that one up. <laughs> we have another question from Harry, just following on from his previous question. He asked, do you think animals that permanently live in urban areas become habituated to bright lights and will there be any long-term effects on the, po on the population? It's, it's complicated. To give you an example, um, there's a study done down at uh, Melbourne Botanical Gardens um, looking at the garden orb weaver spiders and they found that because of the lights they got so much more food that they actually uh, matured faster um, and died younger. Um, so it just shows you that just when you think you're on a good thing you find you're not. Um, it is so complicated for each different species. Uh, so you've got, you've got some, some animals that you know need the dark to hide, you need some to take advantage of the dark to find food and they lose that advantage when the light's not there. Um, to actually genetically change, you know, you need a lot of generations to go through. Um, 
so uh, there's some good stuff being done down at Monash, um, but I don't know the precise details, but that, that's a few examples that I'm aware of. Right, brilliant. Well, we've got a lot of thanks in the chat box tonight, Ken, and a lot of people taking on, on your opinions and points there. So um, a lot of right. proactive chatter going on. So it's okay. been brilliant to have you. I'll pass you um, back over to Renee now. If right. she's around. Can I get in a plug for Melanie? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Sure. So uh, COVID-19 has uh, stopped our um, activities up at Melanie, but hopefully when we get those back, we will be continuing on with the uh, public viewing nights that we've had at Melanie Golf Club for the last three years. Uh, we've got the five biggest public uh, accessible telescopes in South East Queensland up there permanently. Um, and we love to have people come along. We've got a Facebook site called Sunshine Coast Astronomy uh, dash Queensland, so you don't can confuse it with the one just north of Vancouver. Um, and please uh, come along. We'd, we'd love to see you up there. Um, we are hoping, and this is kind of me and Vicky, and I know you're listening, uh, to try and have some sort of public night at the university, but whether it's going to happen this year or not, um, I just don't know, but fingers crossed. Awesome. Okay. That's a great plug. That was actually something that I was going to mention. Um, I've been to a few of the viewing nights and I was telling you earlier, Ken, that every time I'm just blown away more and more and more, um, not only at the strength of that laser pointer you've got, man, that thing goes galaxies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's really incredible to see what, is <laughs> what is up in the sky um, above us, which we don't even notice, which is really special that we're able to see it. Um, just to wrap up, thank you so much, Ken, for your enthusiasm, knowledge, passion, um, for sharing that with us. There was, yeah, a lot of conversations in uh, the chat box. Um, lots of people answering each other's questions, which was nice. Something that I wanted to know is that how can we we as in the general public support you and your mission in um, getting smarter, less polluting light solutions, whether it's on the Sunshine Coast or elsewhere? Well, I think it is raising awareness and public pressure. That's, that's part of becoming a supporter of the Australasian Dark Sky Alliance, either through uh, the Guinness record attempt, or actually becoming um, a subscribing member to ADSA. Uh, the other uh, big resource is the International Dark Sky Association. Um, they have an absolutely wonderful video called Losing the Dark, uh, which goes through kind of a summary of everything we've talked in about four minutes. Um, okay. And, you know, just popularizing that particular video is fantastic and it's really about getting out there and talking to your local members and your council members and um, expressing your concern um, for example up in Mullaney I met yesterday with the new division councillor Winston Johnston and uh, if lots of people in South East Queensland would like to applaud Winston for him promoting dark sky things or tell him to get on with it whatever please do okay. um, he, he's a real ally uh, as Jenny Mackay used to be. Um, but I think the council need it because they know they're going to have to take the fight to Energy Queensland about street lighting. Um, and they need to know the support is out there. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and I guess another way that we can support you would be to when your public viewing nights are allowed to happen, to head along. I know you run them for free, but with um, do donations are accepted and uh, welcomed. Um, so yeah, that's a great night. Um, yeah. Rug up. The donations. Yeah, Sorry. The donations we had last year allowed us to buy a um, big wide screen and HD uh, 4K uh, projector. Mm -hmm. and we only got to use it once before we got closed down. I was there for that one. When, but, woo, uh, it was a good one. <laughs> yeah. So we're really looking forward, and we're we're hoping that when we get back up on the hill that we'll be able to direct screen from the telescopes onto that, that screen. Wow, brilliant. We've got a big dimension cool. to what we're doing. It sure will. All right. Uh, well, on that note, thank you so much, Ken. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining tonight. Um,
Ken, maybe if people have further questions, is there, will he, they contact you through the Facebook page or what's the best way? Uh, they can go through the Facebook page. Um, yeah. Or if there's, you know, they need me to talk to body corporates or anything, then I'm quite happy for you to release my personal email address. I can do okay. that. Okay. All right. Brilliant. Thank you, Ken. Um, just a couple things to close up. The next Coastal Coral Talk is on the 14th of July. The registration link is already live. So if you want to jump over to Reef Check Australia, 